everybody. Welcome to Life Church online service. We're super excited that you're joining us this morning because we have guest pastor Stephen Kim with us. Um, if you'd like any more additional information about the church, please visit us at thisislifechurch.com or you can download our app by typing in This Is Life Church. We hope that you guys are expecting God to do something awesome through us right now as we join in worship together.
Hello, Life Church. It's good to be with you again. Wow, it's been a long time. I can't wait to see some of the people live this Sunday, but all the people in the audience, you're not going to miss out because I do have something special I want to share with you that's been in my heart. So I don't have a, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to get to the passage, Ezekiel 37. This is a vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones. is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And I'm just going to explain to you why. Hopefully, this is not just information, but revelation, and uh, that will transform your life. Okay? Ezekiel 37, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, verse 1, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and he was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, only you know. Again, he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you may come to life. And I will put sinews on you and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive. And you know that I am the Lord." And so I prophesied as I was commanded, and I prophesied there was an, as, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath. And breathe on this lane that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet as an exceedingly great army. What a great passage. Ezekiel 37, can these bones live? I'm talking about bones. I'm talking about bones, people. Bones. Ezekiel was set in the middle of the valley. Now, this is a time when the Babylonians came and 100 years earlier, uh, they captured Israel and took them captive. Now this is the Judah, the sister nation, Israel and Judah. And now they came coming for the uh, Judeans. And now Ezekiel, around the age of 30, as scholars said, is ready to be a priest in Israel, but he has no people. He has no ministry. He has nothing. It's it's a symbol of Israel um, essentially being cursed. Because when the bones... Uh, are just laid out in the valley and there's no one to bury them. It it means that God has abandoned them. That's what the people thought. There's there's not even an honorific uh, ceremony of burying the bones uh, and just even blessing their afterlife. Now these bones are just abandoned. There's no hope. These bones are exceedingly dry. It means that they've been dry and dead. They're good and dead for a long time. I know we go to restaurants now and we eat bone marrow, and I, I really have no idea why we eat marrow, but supposedly it's good. I, I went one time to this restaurant. I'm not going to say the name. Uh, sounds with wild and beast. And we went there and we ate the marrow, and, and I was, it's, it's like $25. It's supposed to be good, but I guess there's supposed to be some life in it. But I, I, I said, you know, we're never coming here. These are bones. There's no meat. And so you see in this valley, there's exceedingly dry bones. It's been there for a long time. The sun has made them whitewashed and dried. And, and so Ezekiel is uh, walking amongst these bones. That's a symbol in Israel as, uh, as one taking ownership. So God is saying, you want to be a priest? Be a priest to these dead bones. Well, what an assignment in ministry. Wow. He says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? Basically, God is saying, do you have hope that these bones can come alive? Now, let's think about this for a second. The answer is no. The answer isn't like maybe, could be. No, they've been dead for a long time. It's exceedingly dry. There's no marrow. It's, it's, it's dead. It's good and dead. There's absolutely, in the natural, there's no way. There's no hope. You know, when we talk about hope, sometimes we mistake, like, biblical hope for a wish. Like, we mistake hope in the Bible 
and we mistake it for like the worldly sense of wish. Like, I hope it, I hope, you know, this winter it doesn't snow. Well, there's a chance that it may snow, but it, there's a chance it doesn't. So you're hoping. I hope, you know, my daughter has a boyfriend now. Now the whole world knows. I, I'm thinking, I hope this boy treats her right. There's a chance that he may, and there's a chance that he may not. And so, but he knows if he does not, then he has to deal with the father. Yes, that's a hope. That's a, like a wish. But biblical hope is a, is a certainty of God's goodness. It's not a wish. It's, it's a certainty. It's going to happen. God works all things for the good of those who love him. So if, it's, if your situation is not good, it means it's not the end. Because that's the promise of God. Nothing is impossible with God in this situation, in the valley of the dry bone. Nothing is impossible with God. God can do all things. He works all things for the good of those who love him. Um, I know that people have been texting, some people have, who I know, at, even at Life Church, have been texting me and asked me if I was, I'm okay. I've been suffering from some ailments for a whole year. I have no idea what's happening. I had to change, radically change my diet. I can't eat spicy food. Look at me, people. I'm Korean. I'm supposed to be eating kimchi, spicy food. I grew up in kimchi. My mother trained me to eat kimchi when I was four years old, the hot spicy. And when I was like, my mouth is burning. She trained me because I'm Korean. Think about it. I cannot do what is natural to me anymore because things are ailing. It started when my father got sick last year and it took me a whole year. About a month ago, I was in the shower. My dad said, my dad said, your father is with me, which I knew, but hearing his voice was so powerful and I felt so peaceful. And right after that, he said, this is, your whole illness is going to come to an end on your father's anniversary, August 9th. So I heard that and I told my wife, I, I felt like God told me, this is all going to come to an end. And lo and behold, I got a call from the specialist. He told me, you're going to probably have to wait almost a year for the, for the scoping and all that to figure out what's happening. Within three months, he called me and he said, you have an appointment August 7th, two days before my father's anniversary. And he said, he said I'm going to do some scoping and I'm going to add a procedure on that you probably don't even need, but I'm just going to add it on while we're there. Let's just do it. My stomach was fine. But in that secondary procedure, which I wasn't even supposed to do, they found something in my body that could have been cancer in two years. In two, he said, you're lucky, man. I knew he wasn't lucky. It's God's providence and ordaining or ordination in my life to preserve my life. But he said, you're lucky. I don't even know why we did this procedure, but you're lucky we came in here and I checked it out. And then they did a biopsy. Nothing was wrong. But he said, we, lucky you got it out because these kinds within two or three years will turn into cancer. Praise God. God works all things for the good of those who love him. I learned lots of lessons. It's whether I trust him or do I just trust him for a season or do I trust him in all things? Do you have hope in all things that God is good and he will work out all things for your good? Do you trust God or are you trying God? Now, I've said this before, but really a lot of times, uh, we try God. We try God like we try a restaurant. If he doesn't deliver what we want, we leave that restaurant and never go back. But trusting God means that we trust him in all circumstances, even in the valleys of our lives, even in the valleys of the dry bones. Can these bones live? Do you have hope? I don't know about you guys, but um, my son cried when the Avengers movies came to an end. Now, you guys might want to close your ears because I, I'm going to ruin the movie for you. But, you know, if you haven't seen the movie yet, but you've been in Mars because everybody's watched the movies. I watched all the DC movies because of my kids. My kids grew up in these movies. They loved it. I wasted so much money in these movies because I, I would, it's three hours long and I would fall asleep every time. I would fall asleep because I knew what was going to happen at the end. They win. It's so boring. They win. Okay, let's go home. They win. Okay, they're losing, but they're going to win. It's like, it's, there's no mystery. There's no, like, thriller. There's no thrill. But the adventure, the last two movies, Infinity Wars, they ended with a suspense, and that got me intrigued. 
and Doctor Strange. He was like doing all this stuff, and he said, out of billion permutations, there's only one way that this will, and then Iron Man has to, for all you guys, if you haven't watched the movie, close your ears, Iron Man dies and then saves the world. That's the gospel. There's billions of permutations, but there's one way. That's called the cross, Jesus Christ, one way. It's like absolutely impossible in a place, Jerusalem, that hated Jesus and wanted him killed. Everybody ran away. There's all these permutations. Everybody's saying there's no one, there's no way. And the devil is saying, I have one, and there's only one way, one way through Christ, one mediator through Jesus Christ. The cross, the instrument of death, became that one way. And if God resurrected Jesus from the dead, then he can resurrect them bones. I don't care what you're going through in your life. You might be going through valleys. Things may be going through despair. Maybe you, as a person, you're going through some dry seasons. Things are not looking good because these people, these Israelites and Judeans, they thought God has abandoned us. And, you know, in fact, God has been warning them for centuries. If you don't honor me, if you don't commit idolatry, this is going to happen. God relented for centuries, but it caught up to them, the consequences of their actions. But even in the midst of, the, of them facing the consequences of their own actions, God still sent Ezekiel to say, can these bones live? God is, see, God is always looking to resurrect, even if it's our own doing. What a great God he is. Even if it's your own doing. The Father is constantly for us, seeking redemption, revival. Can this nation be revived? I think last time, I think 10 years ago, I, had a, I saw a statistic that said there's 1% Christian in Vancouver. There's 1% Christianity in the city. I live in Vancouver, the city of Vancouver, 1% Christianity. I don't know about Delta. I don't know about Fraser Valley. Maybe Abbotsford is like higher percentage, but Vancouver... <laughs> It's 1%. And that's, that's like tell, asking, they ask the people, do you believe you, yourself to be a Christian? And they may go to church like a couple times a year. That's what's called Christianity. So it might even be lower. And it's like the valley of the dry bones. My wife and I have been praying, like this city is the valley of the dry bones. And we've been thinking like, we, we, need, to, we need to maybe move out of this city. But I feel like God is starting to convict me again. Can these bones live? Can, these, can this city be revived? Can this community be revived? If an individual can be revived, a family can be revived, a community can be revived, a church can be revived, a city can be revived, then a province can be revived, can a nation can be revived? Sometimes we feel like we're the only ones. You know, the, the popular worldview out there is so contrary to the gospel to the things that we value. It's so contrary. When, when a woman can have an abortion at the third trimester to the end of term, that's called murder. The only difference is there's a membrane. It's, you just can't see the, see the baby. But if there was no membrane, that would be called murder. My daughter was born uh, premature, five weeks. That's, that's like... Unthinkable, aborting my daughter that's alive. It's so con, and then we just accept it as like the status quo. But I'm here to tell you that where are the Ezekiels? Where are the people of God standing up as an army and say, that's contrary to our God, that's contrary to the heart of God, to what we believe. But there's so many of them, and there's so little of us. God just needs one, an Ezekiel to stand in the midst of the valley and start proclaiming the good news of God. So God says to Ezekiel, hey man, I know God doesn't talk like that, but I'm just translating for the, all the contemporary people out there. Hey dude, what about them bones? Can they live? Can them bones live? Obviously, God knows, the, that God knows the answer. Of course, God is not like, he's not in a dilemma. 
Does Ezekiel agree with me? I don't know if he doesn't. No, he already knows they can live, but he wants Ezekiel to agree. Ezekiel, in the Bible, it says, only you know, God. It sounds so pietous. Only you know. Basically, he's saying, if you want, if you want, if you want it to live, I guess it's up to you. You know, like, I, I, whenever my wife and I, we uh, want to go to a restaurant or something and I'll, for dinner because we're tired of cooking, I'll say, you want to go to this so-and-so restaurant? And she'll say, if you want. But <laughs> then I get a little bit frustrated. No, do you want? Do you want? Because I don't want to force you to go to a restaurant. I don't want to spend $30 on a dish and then you blame me because it was bad, because you're, you're going to say, you forced me to go here. And obviously, she doesn't think like that, but that's what I'm thinking. I want agreement. I want her to say, I want. I want that too. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, I want that. I want what you want. Surrendering to God's sovereignty, like whatever you will be done, whatever it is, God it sounds pietous, but God doesn't just want surrender. He wants submission to his mission. Come under his mission and agree and say, I want that. Agreement is such a powerful thing. I don't know if you understand how powerful agreement is. Adam and Eve not only disobeyed God in the garden. Don't eat from that tree. They disobeyed God but they also obeyed the devil. They disagreed with God, but they agreed with the enemy. In this world, either you're agreeing with God or you're agreeing with the enemy. Either you're holding hands with God or you're holding hands with the enemy. Now, you're not doing it on purpose. I remember when I was a kid, I was walking down the street and I let go of my dad's hand and I was just like looking at some toys. I got distracted. And then I held what I thought was my dad's hand, but it was a strange man's hand. And my dad was behind me watching me for like, I don't know how many minutes I was just holding this strange man's hand. He was leading me wherever he wanted to lead me. And good thing my dad was watching. But I got distracted and I was holding hands, not with a father, but with somebody else. Sometimes we get distracted. Uh, We agree with things that, we shouldn't agree with or we get filled with things or information that we're just in, in, inadvertently just bombarded with and we're agreeing with things. We're agreeing with the enemy. We're agreeing with the strategies of the enemy. We're agreeing with the thoughts of the enemy. I don't think people understand that. Enemy always inflicts fear upon our lives. Fear, dread, calamity, hopelessness, despair. If this is an abundance in your life, then we're going to have to think about who we're agreeing with. Who are we agreeing with? Bill Johnson is one of my favorite preachers. He says this from Bethel Church. He says, fear will always attract information to justify its existence. Fear will always attract information to justify its existence. Got to agree. He has given us privilege as the sons and daughters of God to speak out, to decree the king's decree. You know, in the Genesis, the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters, water symbolizing chaos. The Holy Spirit was hovering over chaos and darkness, waiting to act. And God spoke, and the Holy Spirit acted. In this passage, Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the breath, to the Spirit. Now, we are not commanding the Holy Spirit, but we are agreeing with God and releasing the Spirit's activity in our lives. We have the privilege of speaking. 
speaking out of the heart, what you're filled in your heart, you will speak. So you will know what you're filling yourself with, but what you're speaking. You will know what you're agreeing with, but what you're speaking. Now, this is like a prime season for me because I love politics. Not Canadian politics, though I vote and I honor the leaders of our country, and then I have my preferences and value systems and all that. But Canadian politics is not as entertaining as American politics. American politics is entertainment extravaganza. This is election year, and I'm so, this is usually the time I turn on CNN, Fox News, and just watching, watching, watching. I'm filled myself, filling myself with information. And then my wife will say, you're turning into like somebody I don't know. You're, I'm like getting angry and just criticizing and judgmental and despairing. And the world is going down. We need to escape to the mountains. This is the chaos and chaos is all over the place. America is going down. And I'm just, because I'm watching, I'm filling myself with information that is not of God. As much as there's, the devil has a testimony And he's trying to testify to his power, to his fear, to his dread. And God also has a testimony. Augustine said there's always this tale of two cities. The city of darkness, the world of darkness is always in your face because they have the media and they show you what's happening all the time. Social media, Instagram, cancel culture. You say something something wrong, and then all these people vault on you and then cancel you out. Erase your life. People are afraid to say what they want to say. I'm starting to come out of that. I don't really care anymore. Cancel culture. But hidden underneath, like the winds that circle the earth over and over again, the testimony of God is always there. It's always there. Did you know that 25,000 people in Africa become Christians every day? Did you know that by in a few years, Africa, the continent of Africa, will be 50% Christian? There's so many Christians in Africa. Now, when I go to Africa, they're like, they have to distinguish themselves. Normal Christians, and, there's, and they would say, I am so-and-so, Philip Wututu, so-and-so, I am a born-again Christian. Because there's Christians and there's born again Christians and they're super born again. There's like, because there's so many people. There's services every day. Prayer meeting, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Revival meetings, healing meetings. There's every day. Things are happening all over the world. And China, I think I heard somewhere one time it said 3,000 people are becoming Christians like every minute. God is on the move. I have a friend who is diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Third, three, uh, third stage of uh, ovarian cancer, and, and she's a little bit older, so it didn't look too good. And then she went on this special program, special immunotherapy program. So she thought, Ma, this is special. I'm, I'm going to get healed. She just found out she was on a placebo this whole time. You would say, oh no, what happened to her? What happened to her was God happened to her. It didn't matter. She had medicine. All the tumors disappeared. She done, she's, she's like, it must be God. Heck yeah, it must be God. Because you weren't getting no medicine. You, you weren't doing anything except praying and prayer and agreeing with God who works out all things for the good of those who love him. So he said, do you agree? Do you agree with God? It's not just enough to say, whatever your will done, be Lord, be do it. I don't even know what it is. I'm just going to live my life. What is God saying? Do you agree with it? Even the most impossible things, you have to speak it out. I agree with it. I, I spoke out life for myself for a whole year. Psalm 91, 15, 16. God is going to bless me and give me a long life. Every day I prayed it for a whole year. I have to agree with God, and I, don't, I can't agree with Google, which is an instrument of the devil sometimes. 
WebMD telling you that you have cancer. Come on. Don't disagree. God says, well, then if you agree, prophesy, do something, say something. God doesn't, God, God is not concerned about just you saying, uh, you just agreeing in your mind. He wants you to say something, do something. He wants you to act. He wants you to act in contrary to what you feel. Imagine Ezekiel in the valley of the dry bones, speaking to these bones. Do bones listen? If I'm a preacher, I know some pastors, they feel like they go to church and they're speaking to a bunch of bones. But you know, do bones listen? He must have felt stupid prophesying to bones. But he had to act on what he believed. When I first went to Uganda, my first conference, there were five, five pastors. And I went and I said, how, how is God telling me I'm going to transform this nation with five pastors? But I... I believed in my heart, and so I preached, and I taught like there were thousands. The next year, 250. The next year, 500. And the next year, went on this Ugandan broadcast in television, reaching millions of people. Do you understand? It's like you say and do what you hear from the Lord and what you see in the spiritual realm, not what you actually see. This is called what Chris Valentin calls High values and core values. A lot of Christians have high values. We have noble values. We go to we've been going to church a long time, so we believe in all the right things. But core values, it it signifies you actually believe. Let me give you an example. Now I teach a lot of students. I'm teaching. I'm, I'm going to be teaching six courses in the fall. Pray for me. Online. So I. But I used to, I used to, it's three hour classes. I usually take some time to teach them about life lessons. It's 30 minutes with Professor Kim, life lessons. And I talk about health and spirituality. Many of them are not believers. So I said, you guys want to be healthy, right? Everybody raises their hand. Who wants to get sick and later in life? Nobody. Who wants to be healthy and live a long life? Yay. Me, me, me. And I say, well, how does that value reflect in what you do? Because there was a girl that morning eating Kentucky Fried Chicken, 9.30 in the morning. I said, why are you eating Kentucky Fried Chicken 9.30 in the morning? This is my breakfast. I'm hungry. People drinking bubble tea, liquid cane sugar, Filling themselves with inflammational, oh, I don't want to go into all that, but I'm just saying, smoking, vaping, and they're like, I want to be healthy. See, they have high values. They want that, but their core values says something else. I don't really care. It's just like that with Christians, right? Do we trust God with all things, even our money? When I was in Fuller Seminary, my wife was offered a job because I couldn't work. My wife was offered a job under the table. Now, that would have been quite a lot of money. She said, I want to help out seminarians. This guy owned the business. A lot of seminary students actually work for him. But he said, I'll give you, you know, you just have to do some administrative work, but that'll be $2,000 a month for part-time work. A little bit more, over, more than part-time. And I was so excited. But then the Lord convicted me. You know what he said? It's illegal. You're not paying taxes. This is not what, this is illegal. This is against the law. So what do I believe? This, what do I believe? Is it my core value that I will not cheat? I will not lie? So my wife, I told my wife and I agree, we can't take that job. We suffered. It is not immediately like God sent money from heaven in return for what you did. I'm going to rain down money in your life. No, we didn't. We ate a couple noodles. I, sometimes I gave my last hundred dollars to tithe offering and I, we had no money for a week. But look at, we did not die. I'm still here. I'm still alive. I have two kids going to UBC. UBC is expensive. They live alone. I wish they lived with us so we can save some money, but they live alone. But listen, this is what we call high values and core values. If we really believe what we say we believe, then we have to show it in action. Not only that, not just agree, not just do something, 
He called on, he called on the wind, the ruach, the spirit to come and breathe life. Now, before that, when he prophesied vision, the bones started to come together, bone to bone. And amazingly, they knew what place they're supposed to be in. Imagine having a femur bone in your chest, some finger bones in your face. That would be hideous. But the bones knew, even though they weren't alive, where to go. It symbolizes these bones, these people, they came together and they assembled. Now, in Hebrew culture, in Hebrew theology, bones, when you talk about bones, it also talks about the essence of a person. Then bones. She was the bone of my bone. She was the essence of my essence. What's the person's deep inside, their identity, their future, their purposes? That's what they meant in some ways. And so when they came together, the bones actually understood their essence, where they're supposed to be, who they are. On a side point, I just want to let you know, you can't really find out who you are, identity and purpose, unless you come together in community. That's why church and community is so important. It is essential to our being. I know the government says it's not essential, but I'm telling you, it is essential. More essential than liquor stores and the shopping mall. Just going to throw it out there. It is essential for the people of God to come together, to understand in community, to speak life into each other, prophesy to one another their purposes and destiny, their future reality, not what they are now. But even that, they just came together and then flesh started to come. Flesh on the bones and sinews, ligaments, they come. But, but notice there was no life. It's still dead flesh. People coming together without the Spirit of God is just dead flesh. That's what religion is. People coming together, hearing the Word of God, coming together without the Spirit of God. Even the Word of God can be an instrument of religion without the Spirit of God. You need the Spirit of God to bring the people alive. There can be a vast army that advances, that goes somewhere, not standing still. It's not our work, it's God's work. If we want to do something that only God can do, it, the operative word is God. Only God can do it. Imagine a Ferrari without an engine. It would just all be for show. Can this, this Ferrari go anywhere? No, it's just for show. If we have a church that we do all the right things, we do all the things that we're supposed to do, but without the Spirit of God, it's just all for show. How do we know that we're, com- we're asking for the Spirit of God to come? The evidence of a church that is seeking, not just seeking God's presence and His Spirit to descend upon His people, and not just working off principles, good ideas, godly ideas, is that they put prayer first in their lives. Now, I know Life Church puts prayer first. Yes, you do. But I just wanted to encourage you, make sure the engine of the church is, 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 is the prayer life of the church. Seeking, falling on their face, people who are humbling themselves, seeking His face, for to see only what God can do. Because if we don't pray, we can only see what man can do, and we'll tap ourselves on the, on the back saying, hey, we did something. Just because you did something, it doesn't mean it's a God thing. The devil doesn't care about works done in the name of God as long as God is not doing the work. Who who said that? Steve Kim. The devil doesn't care about works done in the name of God as long as God is not doing the work. So you can do things in the name of God, but God might not be in it because you're not asking to come and breathe on it. Everything we attempt and do We want to see revival. We want to see redemption. We want to see resurrection. We want to see hope in the hopeless situation. We want to see only what God can do. Even if a woman is taking a placebo, we see cancer being removed. We want to see all those things. It all is dependent on prayer. 
dependence on him. So we become an army of people advancing God's kingdom to an individual, to a group, to a family, to a city, to a nation. Anything can happen for people who pray. A nation could change. In Korea, before Korea was separated, north and south, in 1900, there was hardly any Christians, but Methodists, some Methodist pastors came. They gave their lives for the gospel, sharing the gospel. In 1907, in a prayer meeting, greatest revival happened in Korea. Now Korea has almost 30% Christianity. 105,000 young people in 1995 was commissioned before they do anything in their lives to go out into the mission field to give their lives to God for two years. Eight largest churches in, Korea, in, in the world are in Korea. You know why? I believe one of, the, one of the most important things that the Koreans do is pray. Prayer meetings every morning. My father-in-law, my mother-in-law, they've been praying every morning for the past, I think they're 85 now, so my, dad, my father-in-law became a Christian around 30. So 55 years, not one morning missed. Waking up at 4 in the morning, working at the dry cleaners at 10 at night, waking up at 4 in the morning, 5 hours leave, morning prayer, coming eat breakfast, work all day for another 12 hours, doing the same thing, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's fervency. That's dependence. I'm not asking you to do that, but I'm just saying that shows some dependence. It's not just agreement. It's action, but not just action. Is action predicated on asking God's presence, not just working off principles. Do you believe things can turn around? Hope for the hopeless situation? Do you believe that a nation could be changed? Well, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to do it. It's our agreement with God that God can do it. And acting in accordance to God's will and praying. God, do only what you can do. Let me pray for you. Father God, if there's anyone out there right now in a hopeless situation, I pray that you would turn their hearts to you. I feel like there's people out there listening to the wrong information and they're being filled with despair and fear. Now I break off fear and despair in their lives right now. I pray right now where they are, they will be filled with hope. Faith. In this moment, they will believe that God, you are the God of the impossible and that you work out all things for your good and that you are creating an army to advance God's purposes and you are already doing it throughout the world. Let us listen to the right information. Give hope where there is no hope. In Jesus' name. Amen. Till next time, guys. Life Church. It's good to be with you.
gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Amen 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 Once again, thank you so much for tuning in to our online service this morning. We hope that you guys enjoyed Pastor Stephen Kim's message. If you felt God speaking to you through anything this morning, we just encourage you to share this video with your family and friends. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>